Good morning, Blackhawk. It is great to be with you this morning. My name is Curtis Smith. I'm the chairman of the Elder Board here at Blackhawk Ministries, and Merry Christmas to all of you. This Christmas season, we are looking at three pillars of the Christian faith, peace, joy, and love. Last week, Pastor Dave taught us about peace, and next week for Christmas Eve, he'll be teaching us about the gift of love we find in God's Son this Christmas season. And today, I'm going to preach on joy. And let me, let me tell you how that happened. A couple of months ago, I was in Dave's office, and we were kind of mapping out exactly when we would take a break from Joshua to go into a Christmas series and what that would look like and what each week would look like. And Dave said, we're going to go through peace and joy and love. And he said to me, which one do you want to preach on? I know, right? And I, no pressure. And I said, uh, Dave, give me joy because joy is the one that's been eluding me in this season. It's the one that I find the most difficult to experience. It's the topic that I most needed to dive into in this season. And ever since saying that to Dave, God has been hitting me over the head with the word joy. I see it everywhere I go. I hear it everywhere I go. And here's an example, this bag. So this past week, I joined the Blackhawk staff for their Christmas luncheon. And at the lunch, they do a white elephant gift exchange. And they structure the game in a way so that you're exchanging presents before opening them. And people can steal and and all of that is happening. And this present lands right in front of me with the word joy in glittering letters. And Dave's right across from me. I'm like, Dave, it's happening again. God's hitting me over the head with joy. And Dave says to me, this is perfect. You've got a great sermon starter here. You just got joy and somebody's gonna steal it. And you can talk about how somebody's stealing your joy. I'm like, wow, that is good. I might use that. Well, I opened the gift as I'm gonna do for you right now, and reveal a dancing cactus. And you can kind of hear it. That's Buddy the Elf saying, but here's what I just realized this morning as we went through our mic check and our run through. This thing is voice activated. So it's just gonna keep going. So Dave sees the dancing cactus and he says, perfect. Let me get further away. (laughs) It's not gonna stop it. Dave says, perfect. You still have a great sermon starter because no one will steal your joy. (laughs) Renee, come get this ridiculous thing out of here. (laughs) This was going to be something I would either throw away or re-gift later in another white elephant gift exchange. Now it's gonna be in my office and it will always remind me of joy. You know, another side note before we really dive in to biblical joy this morning that I just wanna share with you and maybe encourage some of you, there is nothing in my life that causes me to get deeper into God's word and closer with God than preparing a message for you on a Sunday morning. And I realize that most of you will never have this experience and most of you are probably pretty glad about that. But I would encourage you to look for an opportunity. Maybe it's with your small group. Maybe it's just with your spouse or your kids or some friends. But if you ever have the opportunity to prepare a message, there is no better way to get closer to God, to learn more about his word, than having the privilege and the pressure of delivering his message to his people. I hope you can find a similar way to experience what I'm feeling right now. So back to joy. We live in a fallen world. I don't know if you've noticed that. It's very easy to look around and find a million things to be sad about, 
to be scared, concerned, worried, doubtful about, but it can be much harder to find things to be joyful about. There are even studies done that have shown that everything that's going on in this world is getting to Americans more and more than ever and causing us to be less happy than ever. The National Opinion Research Center out of the University of Chicago has been studying happiness in America since 1972. And the results have never been lower. Only 14% of Americans say they're very happy. It's the lowest number in the history of the research. But the funny thing about joy and the difference between joy and happiness is that you can have it in spite of things, in spite of the news of the day, in spite of your circumstances, even in the midst of them, because joy is not happiness. From a worldly perspective, this is not readily evident to us. According to dictionary.com, here are the top two definitions of happiness. One, delighted, pleased, or glad as over a particular thing. Two, characterized, by or indicative of pleasure, contentment, or joy. And here are the top two definitions of joy. One, the emotion of great delight or happiness caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying, keen pleasure, elation, and two, a source or cause of keen pleasure or delight, something or someone greatly valued or appreciated. The words sound almost identical. The dictionary even uses each word to define the other. Joy is in the definition of happiness. Happiness is in the definition of joy. They sound almost identical. And we can easily confuse the two. When Dave and I were mapping out the Christmas series and I said, joy is the one that is eluding me, what I really meant was happiness is what's eluding me. I shared with you a few months ago, my Monday struggles. They ebb and flow, they are still with me. Some weeks are better than others. And this morning I can share with you that it is just overall a challenging season of life for me. Life just hasn't been one of those cakewalks the last couple of months. It's been tough. And some days I handle that well and some days I don't. Some days I rest in the knowledge and peace of God's sovereignty. Some days I don't do a great job of doing that. And when I let my circumstances and the fear they cause crowd out my faith, my happiness tends to go away. But joy in Christ is always there for me. Every day in every circumstance. Like many of you, the most joyful moments of my life are are ones that you might expect. September 10th, 1994, the day I married Jesse. April 25th, 1996, September 8th, 1998, April 3rd, 2002, the birth of my three sons. The most joyful moments of my life and countless moments with the Lord. Many of them right here in this room. But if my life were a movie, if you could watch my life on screen, I don't think you would pick any of those moments as the happiest moment of my life. I think you would pick June 12th, 1984. It's game seven of the NBA finals. (laughs) My beloved Boston Celtics are coming down the wire in a very close game and they beat the hated and evil Los Angeles Lakers. You can laugh at that, but that part was true. Um, And it was a close game and I reacted, this is the summer I turned 12 years old and the Celtics meant far too much to me. They probably still mean a little too much to me. And I reacted by jumping up, running around the house, screaming and yelling and waving my hands. And then I literally ran out and ran up and down my parents' street, running around, screaming and waving my hands. Do you, do you remember the scene in Home Alone where, where Kevin wakes up and he realizes, oh my gosh, my family's gone. And, and, and he runs around the house screaming. This is what that scene looked like. 
And that's what I looked like on June 12th of 1984 when the Celtics won the championship. And if my life were a movie, and man, I hope technology never advances to where you see all the scenes of my life, you would pick that reaction as the happiest moment of my life. But here's the thing, that was a temporary feeling. It was an emotion, it was a reaction to something. I was happy, but I wasn't joyful. For this sermon, I actually had to look up the date. I didn't even remember what the date was. I knew it was 1984, but I didn't know it was June 12th. The dates that have brought me joy, I don't have to look up. I know what they are. So we know the words happy and joy are very similar and can easily be confused, but when we understand joy from a biblical perspective, we see that it is actually quite different from happiness. Last week, Pastor Dave shared a video from the Bible Project on peace. And this morning, I wanna share a similar video from the Bible Project on the topic of joy from a biblical perspective and how it differs from happiness. Let's check it out. Being in a good mood is really great. And most languages have lots of words to describe the experience, like happy, cheerful, joyful, and so on. The same goes for the languages of the Bible. In ancient biblical Hebrew, there's a variety of words like simcha, sason, or gil. In the Greek New Testament, there's kara, euphrasune, or agaliasis. Each word has its own unique nuance, but they all basically refer to the feeling of joy and happiness. Now, what makes these biblical joy words interesting is noticing the kinds of things that bring happiness and also seeing how joy is a key theme that runs through the whole story of the Bible. Let's start with sources of joy. On page one of the Bible, God says that this world is very good. And so naturally people find joy in beautiful and good things of life, like growing flocks or an abundant harvest on the hills. The poet of Psalm 104 says, a good bottle of wine is God's gift to bring joy to people's hearts. People find joy at a wedding or in their children. There's even a Hebrew proverb that compares the joy that perfume brings to your nose with the joy a good friend brings mm. to your heart. However, human Human history isn't just a joy fest. The biblical story shows how we live in a world that's been corrupted by our own selfishness. It's marked by death and loss. And this is where biblical faith offers a unique perspective on joy. It's an attitude God's people adopt, not because of happy circumstances, but because of their hope in God's love and promise. So when the Israelites were suffering from slavery in Egypt, God raised up Moses to lead them into freedom. And the first thing the Israelites did was sing for joy. Even though they were in the middle of a desert, they were vulnerable, the promised land was still far away, they rejoiced anyway. Later biblical poets looked back on this story and they remembered how the Lord caused his people to leave with joy, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. This joy in the wilderness, this was a defining moment, a way of saying that the joy of God's people is not determined by their struggles, but by their future destiny. This theme appears later in Israel's story when Israel suffered under the oppression of foreign empires. The prophet Isaiah looked for a day when God would raise up a new deliverer like Moses. That's when those redeemed by the Lord will return to Zion with glad shouts, with eternal joy crowning their heads. Happiness and joy will overtake them. And while the Israelites waited, they chose joy to anticipate their future redemption. This is why it's significant that when Jesus of Nazareth was born, it was announced as good news that brings great joy. We're told that Jesus himself rejoiced and gave thanks to God his Father when he began to announce the kingdom of God. He even taught his followers the same joy in the wilderness, saying, when people reject you or persecute you for following me, rejoice, be very glad, because your reward is great in heaven. After his death and resurrection, Jesus commissioned his followers to go out and announce the good news that he was the risen king of the world. And as they did so, the early Christian yeah. communities were known for being full of joy, even when they were persecuted. Like when the apostle Paul was sitting in a dirty Roman prison, he could say that he's chosen joy, even if he gets executed. He called this the joy of faith or joy in the Lord. He believed it was the gift of God's spirit, a sign that Jesus' presence is with you, inspiring hope in the midst of hardship. 
And when you believe that Jesus' love has overcome death itself, joy becomes reasonable in the darkest of circumstances. Now, this doesn't mean that you ignore or suppress your sorrow. That's not healthy or necessary. Paul often expressed his grief about missing loved ones or losing friends or his own freedom. He called it being full of sorrow and yet rejoicing. As he acknowledged his pain, he also made a choice to trust Jesus, that his loss wouldn't be the final word. This is very different from the trite advice to turn that frown upside down. Christian joy is a profound decision of faith and hope in the power of Jesus' own life and love. And that's what biblical joy is all about. I've heard three different ways to describe how Christians have joy. An attitude we adopt, a choice and a profound decision. Three different ways to say the same thing. Joy is not an emotion or a surface level reaction to what's happening in our lives. True joy, biblical Christian joy is a choice. Joy is not an emotion or a feeling, it's a decision. And in the case of biblical joy, a profound decision. If you're a note taker, this is your first point for your notes this morning. Joy is not an emotion, It is a choice. Let's start with Jesus, always a good idea. In Hebrews 12, 2, the Bible tells us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. When I read that verse, I thought, well, the obvious question is, What is the joy set before Christ? I think we understand enduring the cross and despising the shame, but what was the joy set before Christ? For Jesus, the joy was not in his circumstances. In fact, his joy existed in spite of his circumstances. And that is the difference between happiness and biblical joy. Happiness is an emotion. There are over 200 references to joy in the Bible, and many of them come in moments of horrible circumstances. But as usual, we don't have to look any further than Jesus himself for an example of how to be joyful. Hebrews 12, 2 says that Christ focused on the joy and endured the cross and the shame. Jesus suffered the most painful death of all time because there's a physical aspect to his death, the slow, excruciating nature of death by crucifixion. And there was this emotional aspect to his death as well. The shame the Bible uh, mentions refers to one of the intended outcomes of crucifixion. It was meant to cause shame and death. While we usually see artist renditions of Jesus or someone else being crucified, with a loincloth or something else covering them, most people are actually naked when they were crucified. This naked, public, prolonged death didn't simply serve to kill someone, it was to shame them, to invite others to look down upon them and to serve as a warning to others. But these two aspects, the physical and the emotional, They're not the reason Jesus died the most painful death in human history. After all, other people have been crucified. It is the spiritual aspect of his death that makes it the most excruciating moment in human history. On top of the unbearable physical pain and the -the over-the-top emotional pain, Jesus' death came with the spiritual pain of the wrath of God. Every bit of God's hatred of sin, every bit of his justice, every bit of his righteous anger, all of it was dumped on Jesus. When Jesus fell on his face and said to God, to God if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, this is what he was talking about. I don't believe he was worried about the physical pain of being crucified. I don't think he was worried about the emotional pain of a public shameful death. I believe it was experiencing the wrath of God. I believe it was the coming separation from his father that caused him to say this. And he knew this separation would be temporary. 
And this thought was temporary because he instantly follows it by saying, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And Hebrews 12, two makes it clear. The driving force behind the comments Jesus makes and the driving force behind his actions of willingly subjecting himself to death was joy, the joy set before him. And I think there were two aspects of this joy for Jesus to endure the cross and the shame. First, he knew he would soon be reunited to his father, seated at the right hand to reign for all of eternity. But secondly, he knew his death would open the doors for you and me to have eternity with God. Community with God and community with others is what Jesus considered joy. And look, I've spent time with me. I don't get it. I'm not worth it. I'm not that great. I know I don't deserve this gift. But Jesus joyfully gave himself up for me and for you. The Bible tells us that Jesus became sin so we could become the righteousness of God. He loves us more than we can comprehend and sacrificing himself for our sake brought Jesus joy. And for Jesus, this was an active, willing, and even joyful decision. For us, the joy we get to experience is similar in this way. It has nothing to do with our circumstances. Our joy comes from community with Christ. This is the second point for note takers in the room this morning. Joy comes from community for us and Jesus. And for us, it comes in community with each other, community with God above all else, but community with each other. Billy Graham said, quote, life without God is like an unsharpened pencil. It has no point. Life without Christ is pointless. Life with him is more meaningful than we can put into words and it is filled with joy. Don't miss this, no matter your circumstances. And against the backdrop of a savior who chose joy in the midst of an undeserved sacrificial death, Charles Spurgeon noticed a lack of joy among Christians when he said this, quote, I do not think the church rejoices enough. We all grumble enough and groan enough, but very few of us rejoice enough, end quote. Yeesh, right? When I found this quote from Spurgeon, I was so convicted because I do not rejoice enough. And even worse, I don't just grumble and groan. I let the circumstances of my life rob me of the joyful attitude which Christ has instilled in me. There are times when I still do a terrible job of letting my circumstances win. I give them the throne of my heart and I don't choose joy. As the Bible Project video mentioned, Paul wrote more than half of the New Testament and there are times his writings took place in Roman prisons. But without study and historical context, it's almost impossible sometimes to tell which words were written in freedom and which words were written in prison because his message was constant and consistent. In Philippians, Paul writes to the church of Philippi, this letter was written towards the end of his life in a Roman prison with a brutal death of his own just around the corner. But reading most of the letter, you would never know Paul's circumstances. Paul's words in Philippians are joyful, encouraging, inspiring, and focused on God. In his book, Life Lessons from Philippians, Max Lucado wrote, quote, the believers in Philippi were struggling. They were trying to grow in faith and live for Christ, trying to deal with conflicts and threats of persecution. The apostle Paul was stuck in a Roman prison when he wrote to this young church. His letter could have focused on his own troubles. Instead, he wrote about, a livi about living a life full of joy, peace, and contentment. He reminds us of important biblical truths and points to Jesus as the ultimate example, end quote. And he does this in ways that I'm pretty sure I couldn't do or wouldn't do. 
In the first chapter of his book, Paul looks at his imprisonment as a blessing because it gave him a chance to preach the gospel to the guards. And he says he rejoices in it. Just amazing. Do you look at every situation as a chance to be joyful? Do you point people to Christ? Do you share the gospel through your words and actions? I don't always do these things. It's very easy for me to become self-absorbed. It's very easy for me to miss the opportunities to spread the love of Christ and ultimately cost myself the opportunity for joy. The ultimate joy, because nothing is as fulfilling, nothing causes as much joy as playing a role in the work of the Holy Spirit to change someone's eternity. God doesn't need us for this, but he allows us to play a part. And how much joy do we rob ourselves of because we miss those opportunities? In the fourth chapter of Philippians, we see Paul continue to live out the way that Jesus summed up all of God's commandments. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 and 40, in hopes of tripping him up, the Pharisees challenged Jesus to name the greatest commandment. And Jesus responded by saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. Jesus sums up all of God's commandments by saying, love God and love others. And here in Philippians, in the depths of a Roman prison, with his own brutal death, very shortly at hand, we see Paul live these words out. Repeatedly in the first several chapters, Paul's joy is found in the glorifying of God. And then in the first verse of chapter four, Paul writes, therefore my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown stand firm thus in the Lord my beloved. Paul describes his friends in Philippi as his joy and his crown. Paul puts Jesus' words into action towards the end of his life. In the worst of circumstances, Paul praises God and encourages others. Jesus told us what to do, and Paul shows us how it's done. Are you placing that kind of value on others? Are the relationships in your life your joy and your crown? Are you living out the gospel with people in real and tangible ways? Are you praying for your spouse, your kids, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers every day? These are the things that Paul was doing even while in prison and he described them as joy. Years ago, I saw the word joy turned into an acronym which summarizes the order in which we are to put things. And when we do, we will experience true joy. Here's this graphic, Jesus, others, yourself. That's joy. Keep your priorities in this order and you will find joy. You will find it in the moment you will find it in all circumstances and you will find it and experience it for all of eternity in the presence of the Lord. Jesus, others, yourself. Back in Philippians, all of Paul's words lead to probably the most famous verse of the book, Philippians 4.13, where Paul writes, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. But look at the verses leading up to it. In verses 10 through 12, Paul writes, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of placing of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then he writes that he can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul acknowledges that there are times of need and times of pain and times of suffering, but sneaks in a truth that sometimes we overlook, that in times of plenty, in the times that are high and feel great and are filled with happiness, we must continue to find our meaning and our value and our joy in Christ. 
all circumstances, the good ones and the bad ones are fleeting. And while it's easy to see the challenge of difficult and painful circumstances, it is more difficult to see good and easy circumstances as times of need, but they are. The best circumstances here on earth are meaningless if we aren't living our lives for God. As Jesus says, love God and love others. This is how we find fulfillment, purpose, and joy, not in the things of the world. And the world is going to tell you it's everything else. The world is going to tell you it's stuff, it's wealth, it's fame, it's the adoration of others. There are things in this world that will bring you joy, but these aren't those things. They don't bring joy. The Bible tells us where joy comes from in Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It comes from God. And in James 1, 2, we're told how to find joy in all of and even the worst of our circumstances. The Bible says, count it all joys, all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Count it all joy. This Christmas season, we can have joy because we remember the birth of a holy and infinite God who loves us more than we can understand. And after we broke covenant with God, he didn't just sit in heaven helplessly and hoping and wishing that somehow he could reconnect with us. He purposely and intentionally stepped out of heaven to do it. The creator of the world placed himself in position to be created. Born of a virgin, he who has no starting point humbled himself in the most miraculous way, creating for himself a poor human starting point in a way you probably wouldn't have chosen. I know I wouldn't have. This Christmas season, let's celebrate and be joyful that we have a Lord who loves us that much. Earlier, I shared that God has been hitting me over the head with the word joy lately. I was prepared to tell you that the Christmas lunch singing cactus was the latest example of it, but it's not because I woke up this morning and the first thing I did is I opened my phone up to the Bible app and this was the verse of the day. I don't even have it written down. I had to find it in my Bible. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. I don't know if you've ever done the daily verse on the Bible app, but you, you see the verse and then there's a little video message and then two or three slides later, the, it, the Bible app gives you kind of a choice. You have three choices. How am I going to live out this verse today is essentially what they're asking you. And this is exactly what the first choice was. I can't make this up. I need him to fill me with joy that doesn't depend on my circumstances. That, open the Bible app after church today. That is the first choice you have in response to this verse today. I'm looking at my phone this morning going like, okay. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I'm literally gonna use this don't depend on your circumstances theme 28 times this morning. I've already got it. God continues to hit me over the head with joy because I think we all need it. Spurgeon said we grumble and groan enough, but do we rejoice enough? I wanna end by doing something that I often do because I am the world's worst singer. I prefer to just read you lyrics of songs rather than sing them. We sang these words earlier this morning, joy to the world. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. 
Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness. And here are the opening lyrics of the song we're going to sing to close our time together in a few minutes today. O come, all ye faithful. O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. O come and behold him, born the king of angels. These great Christmas songs proclaim the truth. The joy of the world is simply that Christ has come. His presence and his reign as king is all we need to be joyful. His reign over all the earth causes the planet itself, the rocks, the hills, the plains, the fields to proclaim his joy. And when we come and behold him, we are to be joyful and triumphant. You won't always be happy. Life won't always be easy, but true joy is found in Christ alone. This Christmas, oh come, let us adore him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you don't give up on me, that you don't give up on us, that you continue to put joy right in my face with blinking neon lights, it feels. And Lord, I apologize and repent of my repeated sin of letting circumstances get to me, of choosing moments of despair and sadness when I have been saved by the Son of God and am full of joy. Lord, in good times and bad, I pray for all of us here that we would not let our circumstances dictate who we are, how we are, what we do, what we say. Lord, help us to be joyful. Help us to rejoice, to not grumble and groan, but to rejoice in you. Jesus did it facing death. Paul did it in the depths of a prison. Help us to do it in our daily lives. Lord, at Christmas, we're reminded more so than other times that you left heaven and were born as a humble, poor baby to experience life as a man. And we thank you and praise you for that. And we find that our joy is simply in the fact that you have come. Lord, I lift up all of these prayers and each man and woman and child in this room. I thank you for this place and for your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.